Now we're going to rewind a little bit here back to the year where I was delivered in 2011, the year of my major breakthrough. Right after that major breakthrough, one of the first things Jesus started teaching me was that churches are an error. And it wasn't just a church that I was attending. It was all churches. I started fellowshipping a little bit more with online brethren who had been receiving a lot of the same teachings and revelations. And throughout the internet, people from different backgrounds, different churches, different areas, different locations, different countries, were all receiving the same message from Jesus that church is completely off. To this day, the message is still the same. Jesus has not yet showed me a single church that is doing exactly what he's looking for and is pleasing to him. All of them are in some form of hypocrisy, sin, and some problem. This is so bad, and has been bad for such a long time, that if you look at in the 1800s, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church, when he was 16, he was seeking God to find out what church he was supposed to join. Jesus and the Father did appear to him, and the Father told him to listen to Jesus, and Jesus told him that none of the churches are obeying him and all their creeds are an abomination to him. He told Joseph Smith to obey his commandments and go his way. In other words, go, go your way, go on, and make sure you obey my commandments. Joseph Smith did not do that. He fell into sin, and then he got deceived with the whole golden tablets thing and then started the Mormonism church and started adding to the same problem. Now, what I'm getting at is, Jesus showed me that there's a problem with church. I was ready to leave, and he did not want me to leave right away. I did not get the go-ahead. He did not give me the instruction. He did not give me the loosing to just leave. This was torture for me. However, he did give me fellowship. You've heard me mention this men's prayer group that started from another church that was close by to my home church at the time. I'm going to explain a little bit more about this prayer group, where it came from, and so on. Because uh, there are some important things that are going to be mentioned about this group in the future. Basically, there was a neighboring church who had a men's prayer night on Mondays and Wednesdays. I had made friends with some of the people there through some of the young people at my own church, through traveling in the choir and whatnot. So I'd go and visit once in a while. I was invited to this men's prayer group, started going, and I stuck with it. This men's prayer group was headed by another minister. This minister was not the pastor of that church. He was just a minister in that church, but he was the one who was really spearheading the move of this prayer meeting, as well as other prayer meetings at other churches. On Thursday, there was another church who also had a prayer meeting that I attended that was associated with the prayer meetings on the Mondays and Wednesdays. So I got my fill of Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday night prayer meeting with men, and all these men were coming together because they wanted to pray about the issues in church, which was great. Gifts of prophecy were being utilized in this uh, prayer group, and everyone, it was it was the closest thing to the uh, church you would see in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians and so on. That was the closest that I got to experience at this time in my life. So I started fellowshipping with these guys, and I was still going to my own home church at the same time. But let me tell you, it was really, really rough. Uh, I stayed at my home church for 14 months. Halfway through going to going through all of this, I did leave and I got convicted. I spoke to the pastor telling him I was done and Jesus led me back. I went to another church and the pastor at that church started preaching and I started getting convictions that I was supposed to be back at my old home church. I don't remember the exact message, but the message was along the lines of needing to be there for, for a particular purpose. So I yielded and I went back and I, I, I spent the entire time there that Jesus wanted me to have there. But it was very rough. There's times I ended up running home from services because of how hard I was getting attacked with temptations. I didn't even mention this one in the list in the video before. But during conventions and stuff, girls were on the pulpit in the choir and stuff. I, I wasn't even participating in very many choir events at this point either, especially in the later times. Uh, I was just telling everyone about what Jesus was giving me. That, that was what my focus was. But anyway, there'd be girls on the pulpit and they would be dancing, not immodestly, but there was something wrong where I would be getting shot with arrows with lust. And I literally, there's one day I ran home. I left the church and I ran home from church. Uh, there's times where I'd be sitting there listening to the preaching and the preaching was just, it, I was just getting ripped up because it wasn't the truth or it was just fluff. It wasn't really helping anyone and everyone was sitting there in sin. 
Jesus would be telling me about things. He'd be explaining things to me and teaching me while I was there. And it would just really, really frustrate me. Uh, and I also had to stay set apart. Jesus didn't want me participating in certain things because it would just be blatant hypocrisy. On top of the fact that everyone there was still sinning. Now, it wasn't all bad. There were times where if I had stayed up on Saturday night and just prayed and I was seeking Jesus, and this happened regularly, Jesus would tell me the entire sermon that was going to be preached the next morning, especially if the, the sermon was from him. Jesus would minister to me, give me the sermon that was going to be spoken, and then encourage me and actually give me teaching on the sermon that night before it even happened. The next morning I would go to church and th th they would preach the same sermon I was hearing last night. I didn't know this was happening until maybe a good month or so or a few months into this. I realized, wow, I, I keep hearing the sermon before it happens. I found this to be really cool because it gave me an opportunity to hear the same message twice. And Jesus was giving me teaching on it the night before. However, there was still a great level of discomfort with the amount of sin and hypocrisy that was going on within the assembly and things that I was seeing. However, again, Jesus wanted me there and he held me there. The reason why Jesus wanted me there is because during testimony time, I had the opportunity to get up and share my testimony about what Jesus had been doing with me, about teaching me how to stop sinning and teaching me how to overcome temptation. That was basically my mission there. Jesus wanted me to be a witness in that place. And I found out that that was part of the reason why he wanted me in that church from the very beginning before I even knew anything about what his will was. He had a specific purpose of leading me there, cleaning me up, getting me on the same page as him to then testify and say, hey, listen, this is what Jesus has been doing. This is what he's been doing in my life. This is what the Bible says. This is what we're supposed to be doing is repenting and turning from sin this way. So I did this. And when I understood that this was the mission, it helped me stay. But it was still very, very, very difficult. There was times where the preaching was like 99% fluff. 1% something useful. And I was wowed this one time because I was getting very frustrated. I wanted to leave. And Jesus just told me, hey, just, just sit tight. I'm going to deal with all that fluff. Just listen. So I listened. And I, I caught that 1% one, 1 that was good. And I left. The next day, I was speaking to another brother of mine, one who had also been very close to me. And that 1% I heard in that sermon that was good, he needed to hear it. So I shared it with him. And Jesus humbled me and showed me that he's very resourceful. That even if someone's talking a whole lot of filth and talking a whole lot of stupidness, if there's 1% that can be used to help someone, he, he would actually use it. And later on that day, that same person, um, the pastor who preached, ended up talking to him. So he really needed that encouragement. Jesus told me that with all the other stuff, he deals with it later. He's, he's going to deal with it. Because what I mean by fluff is really false doctrines, lies, error, distractions, and things that are a complete waste of time. So the fact that Jesus said he would deal with it, uh, that comforted me and helped me change my attitude towards what Jesus was calling me to do uh, in that assembly in being patient and long-suffering. By August of that year, this would have been 2012, I ended up having an experience with prophecy. I mentioned earlier in the video about being anointed with spiritual oil that some of the experiences there were relevant to a future prophecy. This would be that prophecy. The experience I had where oil dropped on my head and I started speaking in tongues in front of the entire congregation. I did not experience that again, but I did experience something where I was kneeling down praying by the altar and then Jesus told me okay say I think it was seek my face and I didn't want to because number one the pastor was still speaking and I didn't want to interrupt him and number two like the service was about to end but mainly I, did, I didn't want to have to interrupt the pastor he was speaking now the pastor was ending service he wasn't preaching it wasn't anything that was substantial like very important he was just saying something about how you know this week we're probably going to do this or that and look out for this particular event and so on and I kept getting convictions to do this, and I was refusing. I did not want to interrupt the pastor when he was speaking. And Jesus said to me that I don't have to do it. But if I don't do so, later on this evening, when I realized that I did not obey him and how, how important this was, I'd feel very convicted and I would not feel good with myself. And he was right. I knew that. As soon as he said that, I was like, oh, he's right. Okay, what do you want me to say? <laughs> and he said it again, seek my face. 
So by faith, I obeyed. And I said it out loud while I was kneeling down. I said, seek my face. And I was lifted up. Okay. Jesus lifted me up. So I stood to my, my feet. And then I believe I said it again or I said something else again. The pastor continued speaking over me. And I was ready to kneel back down. So I'm like, okay, he continued speaking. I'm kneeling back down. I tried to kneel down and I physically couldn't. I tried to move and I bent, but I couldn't go all the way down. I was lifted straight again. And then the flowing started coming out. And the reason why this flowing came out was because I had already submitted. I had already submitted when I said, seek my face. Jesus then just allowed prophecy to start flowing in tongues. And the pastor then went silent. And the prophecy, I don't remember all the words now. This is back in like 2012. This was like, like eight years ago. Basically, I remember Jesus saying that he was a good shepherd. People were supposed to be following him, not to follow after strangers, to seek his face. Why are they looking for him in other areas and looking for him in different places? That he's here, as in with them. The prophecy ended with me turning and staring directly into the pastor's face as he was standing up by the, the podium. And I said to him, looking into his eyes, you need to seek my face. And then when I, when I had spoken these words, which was Jesus, obviously, and the pastor did not need to seek my face, he needed to seek Jesus' face. When I said these words, he said, okay, that was enough. I kneeled back down, continued praying, and that was the end of that prophecy. I was thankful that I had done so, and I obeyed Jesus, and that was done and over with. This prophecy is going to be something that comes up in the next video again because I do end up speaking to the pastor and I'm going to be going through that conversation in, in the next video. Now, November of 2012, so a few months later, I'm laying down in my bed and then Jesus basically tells me he doesn't want me to go back to the church anymore. And, I, and I'm like, uh, like what? And then I saw a vision in my mind because I, I really wasn't sure if this was Jesus. I'm like, really? Like, like why? Like, what's, what's going on? After all this time of wanting to leave, now he says leave and I'm, I'm, like, I'm questioning it, <laughs> right? And I see a vision in my imagination. It wasn't like an open screen vision, but these thoughts were coming into my imagination. And I saw the Catholic church. I just saw the, the stained glass windows and just how the Catholic, Catholic church is set up. Then I saw my church that I was attending at the time, my at the time home church. And then Jesus asked me, what was the difference? <laughs> and I looked at this, I was like, wow. There isn't really much of a difference apart from culture. I mean, you still got the pews, you got the pulpit, you have the choir. You have a lot of the same stuff. And then Jesus said to me that these were cults and his body is not a cult. And I was like, whoa, oh, okay. Because I wasn't expecting Jesus to drop the C word on me like that, calling churches cults. Like he called all of them cults. And he said his body is not a cult. He explained to me that his body obeys his voice. His, his, his church follows him. These churches were cults. So I was really put off by that. And then he, this is one o'clock in the morning, by the way, he told me to get up, go online and look up the definition of cult. Cause I, I didn't actually know the definition. So I got up, went to dictionary.com back in 2012. I don't know if it gives the same d definition now as definitions tend to randomly change over time. Literally, I've seen this happen between then and now. Um, and I read the definition and it freaked me out because out of about 10 definitions, about eight of them describe church. One was just people getting together who all revere the same kind of object or thing. That's what people do in church. They get together because they revere Jesus or the Bible. Um, there was something about how cults generally have their own rites uh, and ceremonies and different types of things like this. And the example given was rites of baptism which you find in Catholic church, in, in churches, right? So this tripped me out because I had eight definitions here that sounded like church, and the examples given were church examples, including denominations. And that's when I realized, wow, so all this time, you hear people calling things cults, and the truth is, the religions in this world are all cults, and the big cults call the little guys cults, and they call themselves religions, who defines what a religion is? Realistically, it's the bigger one wins. If there's a lot of people that agree with a belief system, they're going to call that a religion. And then within that religion, there will be denominations and divisions. And some of those denominations and divisions are going to call other people cults because they don't like them. Or the smaller, crazy, uh, out there, dangerous ones, cults. But textbook definition of a cult is what 
you see at church. It, it, churches are that. This really, really, really tripped me out, but it wasn't enough to fully convince me of making this move yet. Because this move wasn't even being initiated now by my desire. This is like, I'm being instructed to do this, so I want to make sure this this was the truth. So I decided to fast for three days, and by the time I made it to day two, the Spirit of the Lord came to me and spoke to me very clear, and it was like a river of rushing water flowing through my, my mind. And Jesus asked me, how long have I been at the church testifying? And I said to him, about 14 months. And he asked me, has anything changed? And I said, well, no, not, not really. Like, you know, I haven't seen any major changes. And he said to me, well, patience suffers long, but not forever. It's time for you to go. And I believed after that, and it was, it was time for me to go. So I ended up asking him what to do, and he told me what he wanted me to do. He wanted me to go out street preaching at this point, and he wanted me out on the streets evangelizing. And that video is going to come up after the video after this one. And he gave me instruction on how he wanted me to handle that and what to do. So when I obeyed this and started doing so and I stopped going to church, I started getting phone calls. People started calling to find out if I was okay and whatnot for for a few weeks. Uh, But then after the few weeks passed, no one really continued contacting me. If they saw me, they saw me and so on. What I'd really like to point out here, and this, this actually really really messed me up as in thought process wise in my views towards church when I left church the very first Sunday I left I noticed that the temptations and the lust attacks that I got dropped dramatically I was getting a lot of lust spirits from church and Jesus showed me it's because a lot of people in the church were full of lust demons some of them were practicing sin in the church lusting after people and, and whatnot and I was getting attacked by this and not being in that environment the temptations dropped dramatically. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention before moving into the next video, which actually preps for the next video, is that after I had left this church, Jesus started teaching me about false prophets. And basically, Jesus explained to me that false prophets are ministers who still sin. In the New Covenant, a false prophet is not identified by simply just giving a false prophecy or leading to just some other God, in this covenant, a false prophet is identified by their fruit. Do they still sin? Which means they can still give true prophecies. They can drive out demons. They can do mighty miracles. But if they're still sinning, they're considered false. And because they're considered false and they still have sin in their lives, Satan uses that, and that's what's used to destroy people. With all that being said, we're going to end this video here and... In the next video, I'm going to explain how Jesus sent me back to that assembly for a particular purpose and how that didn't really go down very well. And I ended up in a meeting with the pastor of that church. This meeting is one of the big reasons why I encourage people to actually talk to their pastors if they have a pastor and ask them the questions that Jesus had me ask this pastor to see if they'll pass or fail. So far in my life, I haven't actually met a pastor who I've spoken to along these lines that has passed.